Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater with Run, Blog, Run with world champion Donovan Brazier. Donovan, thank you for getting together with us on a late Friday afternoon for you. Yeah, it's only 3 o'clock here out west, but, you know, I'm happy to be here. So thanks for having me. Now, where are you based now? I am based out of Portland currently, and I've been kind of hunkered down here since the whole coronavirus stuff's been going on, but in Portland currently. Good, good. Yeah, because I was in Wisconsin up until the end of May, then I just got back out here. So I was just kind of curious. Sure. And you're uh, working with Pete Julian, yep. correct? Okay. Yes, sir. It's us and about eight other guys out here. So, so tell us how this works now, because you got to do the social distancing. Are you training at the Nike berm? Are you kind of guys going to track to track? How is it working for you right now? So early on in the process, um, Nike really just shut down all operations when it came to the campus. Um, so that meant not using the, the weight room facilities. Like we usually have a, a facility that we get like um, a pool workout in or get our massages in or get like a sauna in. All that stuff was taken away because of the coronavirus, obviously. And then um, on top of that, they took away all of the grass fields. So just really no congregating at all at Nike. Wow. So nobody was allowed into Nike HQ. And I think that included the track at one point. So uh -huh. that was, that happened for a good six weeks. So we had to use other tracks around like local high schools and such. So mm -hmm. we did that for six weeks. And then eventually Nike opened the track back up for public use for the most part. It's still kind of more low key and everybody's still, you know, practicing social distancing and not really getting too close to each other. So for the past maybe six weeks now, since uh, um, maybe mid-May, We've been able to use a track and get our workouts on there. But as far as like weight room facilities and as far as like the pool and the sauna and getting massages done at Nike, um, that's all been shut down ever since this stuff's kind of been going on. So how is, what's your typical day like in the COVID pandemic? Mm -hmm. How does it work for you? Um, it, it, it's kind of sad because I've, I've come to realize that like, I don't really do that much stuff apparently because my life hasn't changed too much at all. Um, <laughs> You know, every time I get dinner, it's always takeout anyway. I don't have anybody to go with, really. Craig is doing his own thing, and Eric isn't even in town. So yeah. um, for me, my daily routine is just wake up. I'll go for my run. Um, and I'm in no, like, stress or pressure to get my run in early because that's, like, literally the only thing I have to do all day. So I'll run probably 11 o'clock, get back by 12, eat lunch, and then figure out something else to do. Maybe take a fishing trip out, you know, east or west or someplace. But, um, you know, very relaxed at this time. I'm not really doing, you know anything too differently. Mm -hmm. How uh, long is your, are your workouts each day? Mm -hmm. So if we're doing a normal run day, which is, you know, five, four days a week, it takes a good 40, 45 minutes. You know, I'll range anywhere from like three to seven miles for my runs this time of year. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just once a day. And, you know, that doesn't take too long. And then once we do our track workouts, that can take anywhere from an hour and a half to two and a half hours, you know, depending on how serious we're taking it. Because, you know, a warm-up would take anywhere from, 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how, you know, how good you want to make it. So it varies each day and then we'll dabble in the weight room now and then, but you know, we never really work out or train for track and field track and lifting included more than three hours a day. Okay. How, um, how are you doing with all the meets and stuff being canceled? Are you looking at a few meets this year still? Or are you kind of just taking as it comes? Yeah. So when all these meets got canceled, they were first, a lot of them were getting revised kind of like, I know Prefontaine was supposed to get revised yeah. and Paris was supposed to be revised. And I think Zurich just ended up canceling theirs. But when you're seeing a lot of these meets get canceled, yeah, you know, it's for the greater good and stuff like that. And, you know, probably shouldn't be traveling across the pond to Europe. Sure. But when they're starting to revise these meets, you know, all these meets are getting canceled and like all these marathons just aren't happening. So for my plan, I'm still supposed to race like a Monaco and I think Stockholm and such. But you always have that in the back of your brain where it's like, okay, well, this might get canceled now. You know, so it makes training a little bit harder because you're not as motivated because, you know, there's a lot of what ifs, everything's up in the air and you're not 100% sure if you're even racing. So for me, it, and I know for a lot of guys as well, it's just hard because, you know, it's a lot, there's still a lot of questions and you know, there's a lot more questions than answers at this point. And, you know, in a perfect world, we'd still have a completely revised Diamond League meet or a yeah. Diamond League circuit, but it's just obviously not looking that way, you know, with Paris getting canceled and, um, Prefontaine getting canceled in Zurich and I think Rome's still having theirs but they're having their 800 and like lanes so it's a little different but you know everything is just still up in the air right now and you know all you can do is just train and just do what you know to do. How does uh, coach Julian talk to you about all this does he try to help you put it in perspective? Yeah he, he put it in, in good perspective and just saying that like 
Um, well, first off, when the Olympics got canceled, he was saying, you know, for younger guys like me, this isn't affecting us too bad. Like, yeah, we've had a good year. Like guys like Noah Lyles and Christian Coleman and people that are younger, um, you know, we'll be fine. Be, but at the same time, he also said, we're the, we're the ones that haven't made Olympic teams yet. You know, we have a lot to prove still. So it would have been nice to kind of get that monkey off the back, you know, this time of year. So we're just going to have to wait a year for that. But as far as like fitness and like, um, you know, dying out and burning out, that's not really going to affect us as a young athletes. And when he's talking to me about it and, you know, our group is predominantly young for the most part. So we kind of just it has that basis around everybody. Um, but as far as the diamond league circuits and such, he's just treating every day, like they're going to happen. So that's how we're training. And that's how I'm, you know, preparing to peak my season is, you know, that same August and September. Last summer, I was fortunate enough to watch you win your gold medal in Doha. It was a lot of fun. Got to interview at the press conference, and you were just beaming the whole time. What do you remember from that experience? Mm, from Doha. So, first of all, I love Doha. It's like my favorite. It's my favorite Diamond League meet for sure. Because um, yeah. that was the first time I went there. It was earlier that May. They had a Diamond League there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, from the first time I stepped foot in Doha and like was able to you know, experience the culture and the people and this, the beautiful buildings they have there, I absolutely fell in love with it. So just yeah, making it, cool. it's very, very cool and it's very modern and it's very clean. And, you know, I, I love that about, you know, that part of Doha. And so a part of me was just thinking like, I got to make the team because I got to, I got to go back to Doha. Like I belong in Doha. And I even joke now, like if I could switch my citizenship to anything and be to guitar, obviously that'd be you know, it'd probably be hard to do. But I think I could pass this guitar a little bit. I don't know. I got the guitar. I don't know. But it, it, that's you know, it's a different story. But um, yeah, no, I, I just loved it there. So when I made the team again and coming back, I was just like, I was ready. I was in a happy environment. I was happy to be there. So I think um, all that going on was very cool. Um, and then I believe it was my prelim or my preliminary rounds. So I'm going to take it round by round. My preliminary rounds. Um, yeah. Nigel Amos got, um, he disqualified, or he, what would you call it? He dropped out of the race pretty much with, I believe it was an Achilles injury at the time. Yep. Yep. So a lot of guys yeah. think like, yeah, a lot of guys think like, oh, like if I'm me, like you're happy that Nigel drops out of the race, you know, that's not the case whatsoever. You know, I want to race Nigel, I want Nigel to be there, you know, for yeah. two things, because it makes it honest. It makes it, you know, he, who's the yeah. best in the world, you know, you know, um, shot for shot. And for another reason, it's like, there's no clear favorite at that point. You know, yeah. when you're 20, 22 years old, you almost don't want that pressure. And I was just thinking like, man, I really wish Amos was here because he adds that factor of like, you know, he can beat me, you know, and um, we're going to just, you know, compete like we've been doing all year. And it's always been close every single race between the two of us. So it had been something fun to watch and something even more rewarding to win. Um, but when he dropped out, it was like, now I'm the clear favorite to win. So yeah. it wasn't much of an underdog or, you know, much glory as it was just kind of, a relief for me when I finally, you know, crossed the line for the finals and won just because I think there was so much um, talk about me having to win and or, or me supposed to win instead of me like having the opportunity to win. It was just like yeah. it either wins or it's a failure, you know? So for me, I kind of had that mindset going into it. So um, when I crossed the line and Bryce was right behind me celebrating with me, it was just kind of like, I was just so happy. And I finally got that, you know, that monkey off my back that was, you know, laying on me the past three days going into prelims and semis and finals. But yeah, no, that was Doha. I hope that the Diamond League happens this year again, because I absolutely love it there. But sure. we'll see. What did uh, Coach Julian talk? How did he talk you through the rounds? How did he keep you from losing it in Doha? <laughs> yeah, so he, he did a good job with that. Um, he pretty well, and I've learned from experience too. I, you know, I made the world team in 2017 and sure. I got out in the semis. So I know what it feels like to just, you know, be a letdown and, you know, you earn these spots for Team USA. So yeah. when you earn these spots for Team USA, you don't want to go and travel to a different side of the world and represent them in a, in a bad way. You know, sure. nobody should ever be, when you're wearing the Team USA jersey, you should never be, just be happy to be there. Yeah. You know, you should be there and you should be competing. And, you know, you should be meddling for the most part because we're the greatest country in the world when it comes to track and yeah. field. Yeah. Um, so when I ran in 2017 and I failed to make a final, along with Isaiah Harris and Drew Window at the time, you know, I just felt like, man, like we just did a terrible job at representing the United States when it comes to the 800. You know, yeah. we didn't have any guys make final. Like, that's terrible. So that happened in 2017. 2018, um, I got knocked out at World Indoors in the prelims. Um, still immature. I think I was 20 at the time still. Um, 
And I just didn't have racing strategy down. And again, I had that same letdown where it was like, I'm sorry, everybody. Like, I just wasted a spot. I traveled all the way to Birmingham, UK again. And, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't do what I came to do. Uh, so once Doha 2019 came, I know, I know how it feels to just, you know, to, to be a letdown and to be a choke artist or to, to not achieve what I'm, I was there to achieve. So when 2019 came, I kind of had all that on my back along with a coach who was willing to talk me through rounds, like you said, like Pete was able to do. And I think I just learned from experience. Like it was a big, long, painful learning curve for me. And it still is a learning curve. For, it's still a learning curve for me. You know, I don't know everything. Um, but it was just a lot easier to deal with rather than 2017 worlds compared to 2019 worlds. You know, I was more mature. I was more confident in my workouts. I was more confident in my coach. I was more confident in my training group and my training partners and what I'm putting in my body and what I'm doing. So I think um, all that on top of Pete being able to, um, you know, just control my environment and what I'm doing and, uh, you know, who who I'm listening to and actually enjoying these camps leading up to Doha, I think played a a huge factor in me winning out there. Cool. Um, When I saw you in um, end of January, you ran that 600. um, Mm -hmm. You were really relaxed afterwards and you had just run the second fastest time indoor yeah. history but there seemed to me about 450 to 500 in the race you knew you were just a little bit off from the world record was mm-hmm. that true yeah i could i could tell and okay. yeah that, that 450 mark when i when i look back because at that point i wasn't racing for time i was just racing because i wanted to, to yeah. place good you know so i look back and i had you know the gap that i had which was pretty significant at the time so i was like okay this is just going to be um, another learning experience and I, I took it for granted because I, you know, not every time you step on the tracks, you're trying to break world records or, or break personal best or, or PR, but you know, it'd be nice if you could. So sure. I knew that I kind of messed up the opportunity to do that. I just kind of, you know, relax the final 150 and just kind of in brought it in. Cause I was still, you know, I think 0.8 off of world best and you know, that's a lot to make up in 150 meters. So I knew, I knew it was just gonna be hard to, to catch. But. I talked to Pete right after the race. Mm-hmm. And he said you were having a short season. You were going to pretty much, no matter what, you were going to probably do uh, Milrose. Mm-hmm. And were you even thinking of doing Nanjing? Were you considering the World Indoors? Or, um, no, not at all. I wasn't considering okay. that. I was considering possibly running USA's, um, yeah. depending on how Milrose went, just because we wanted to get a feel for the competition. Like Milrose is like a mini USA's. You know, Bryce yeah. and Isaiah were there. And I just wanted to, you know, I just to go out there and show, like, you know, I'm, I'm still where I need to be. I'm still in good shape. Like, I think I proved what I needed to prove at Melrose. And I didn't need to go run at USA's out in Albuquerque and just kind of um, just be out there just to be out there. You know, I don't think it would have been as satisfying. I think Melrose, I got what, after after racing Melrose, I got what I needed to get out of the indoor season. So we just kind of, we went back and we just kind of focused on training again and just relaxed and just kind of kept on building on what we already built or what we already had in Arizona out there. You said in... Um the new balance, I believe. I'm looking at my notes that after winning the world champs, you kind of got an understanding of what Rudisha was dealing with a bit in it, it, his best. Um, if the world was, everything was healthy right now, how many races would you need to be in racing fit? Um, so like we're talking world racing fit or like diamond league finals or USA's or, but yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Well, we'll go to the top first USA's. How long would it take you to get ready for a USA racing fit? I think, I think I was only planning on running one 800 before this USA's. I think we were planning on running Jamaica. Um, sure. obviously got canceled. So we're going to run one 800 before USA's because once you get to USA's, ideally you're supposed to be running three races. Yeah. And, you know, I think last year I proved to Pete that I don't have to race a lot to kind of get my technique down. I mean, I almost took a full year off before I ran my season opener last year in Doha. So I didn't run outdoors for like, you know, 20, literally 20, 21 months. Yeah. And I went straight into Doha and I competed fairly well. I got third and made a couple of tactical mistakes, but came back in Rome, you know, two weeks later and or no, three, three weeks later and was able to um, kind of fix the mistakes I made. So it really didn't take me too much to, to, to learn. And I think a lot of that is just with fitness. You know, when you have a lot of tools in your box, you can race so many different ways and that's what we've been doing in practice. And I think we just have a, you know, crazy other belief in what we're doing in practice is going to correlate very well um, when racing, no matter what the race is. Mm-hmm. 
when um, you brought something up that I, I want to follow up with, um, you do well in Diamond League. You just won a world championships. Um, totally different situations. Diamond League, where you're trying to run a fast time, and mm. world championship, where all that medals, that's those three medals, that's, yeah. that's the party. How do you, would you explain that to our readers, our viewers? Uh, what's the difference between Diamond League and a world championship? Yeah. So Diamond League does a really good job of like sprucing stuff up, especially the finals. You know, they have yeah. the nice free trophies. They got the cool cars and everything like that. And um, we're just trying to, I guess, represent, you know, track and field at its fastest, you know. And of course, when it comes to sprinting, track and field is always going to be fast. There's no holding back sprinters and such. But when it comes to these 5Ks, really anything over the four, it's tactical a lot of times. You know, people don't pay to see tactical. People pay to see people at their best and giving their best effort. So that's what the Diamond League is kind of, I guess, trying to create when they're having rabbits for the, you know, the 8, the 15, um, mile, two mile, steeple, all that. Um, so the goal for that is, and it's only one race as well. So you don't yeah. have to worry about saving any energy, any energy because there's just one race, you're one and done. You know, top guys are gonna top guys are gonna win, and it's always set up to be fast. So you're just mentally preparing for it to be fast. When it comes to a world championships, you know, obviously there's no rabbit in in any of the races. So what tends to happen is nobody really wants to take the lead on a lot of races, mm -hmm. unless there's a guy like a David Rudisha in the race, of course, who's a yeah. um, front runner, and everybody knows he's gonna front run. Or like this past worlds, Wesley Vasquez is gonna be a front runner. So with all of that, you know. I guess uncertainty in the air. People tend to not run as fast when it comes to anything above 800. So most people depend on tactics. I mean, look at Centro back in, in 26 in for Rio. I know it wasn't world champs, but it was Rio. And you know, it was a completely tactical race up until I believe you know six or 800 meters. Yeah. Uh, so that plays a huge part. And in, in, in there's guys that can win diamond leagues, and there's guys that can you know break records. I think there's been a lot of guys that have broken world records, but have never you know, won a world championships or won an Olympic medal, you know, because they know how to run fast, but they don't know how to run rounds. They don't know how to be tactical and they don't know how to race in groups. They just know how to run fast. And, and that's about it, which, you know, in an ideal world, you could be like Rudisha and know how to do both um, or be blessed enough with the front running power that you don't have to learn tactics, you know, but for the most part, that's the biggest thing is that, you know, sometimes there's guys that are meant to break records and sometimes there's guys that are meant to, um, you know, win medals and sometimes, you know, they go hand in hand. It seems to me in observing you with coach Julian, that what he's trying to teach you is how to win and how yeah. to be in the race, no matter what race it is. Yeah. Um, when he's preparing you for a championship event, a global championship worlds or Olympics, what is he talking to you about? What is he trying to, how is he trying to get into your head? I think he's just trying to, to build that confidence in my head. We built a group um, with Pete's athletes where it's like, it's a genuinely fun training environment to be in. Uh -huh. um, like, of course, we're, we're serious when, when it's time to practice and we spike up or whatever we're doing, whatever workout it may be. But when we're going to St. Moritz or we're going to Battergaz or we're going to, you know, these training camps over in Europe, it's just, you, you know, you feel blessed to be surrounded by the athletes that you're, you're, you're with. You, know, you got Eric, you got um, Craig, you got Jessica, you got Coco. Um, and he has Sugar and Shannon and so many great athletes. Um, so when you're around, you know, a group that kind of they all click and they all, you know, have their own personalities and everything flows right. I think that's a, a big part of it. Um, so I think he does a good job at making sure where I guess I don't want to say happy because it's not always about being happy, but just making sure our headspace is right because I think that messes with a lot of people is their headspace not being right, including yeah. myself when I was on the, you know, the pro circuit the first, you know, couple of years, I had that huge learning curve, like I said. And when I was going to these places and traveling to places by myself and not having, you know, somewhat of a team or a training group to be with, it, you know, it weird on me mentally and physically, I believe, because I didn't have that, you know, that support system or that, you know, those friends or, or, or as much fun in doing things. So I think he does a good job at being able to balance us having fun and us, and get the right guys in to make the group, you know, better physically and um, just, um, I guess, connectively wise too. Okay. Uh, early in the conversation, you mentioned that you do a little fishing. What do you fish for up there? Mm -hmm. Well, in Oregon, they have a bunch of lakes that are getting stocked. So I go out to a reservoir about like, probably an hour outside Portland. I go out there and 
I think last time I've been there was probably a week ago, but you know, you can limit out on five trout. I try to catch trout because that's all they oh, cool. you know, eat out here. Yeah. So yeah. trout fish. Yeah. Um, I grew up in Michigan. So all I really fished for in Michigan was I go to like the piers and the channels out there and catch catfish or sheephead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sheep obviously, but the, yeah. the catfish are pretty. And, um, oh, sure. or I'd, yeah. Or I do something simple like panfish, like the bluegills or the perch or the crappie or whatever. So Oregon's mainly, mainly trout out here. What else do you do for recreation? Um, I like to play basketball a lot. You know, I don't, I can't really get in competitive games because obviously, you know, I can get hurt, but yeah. you know, I'll go to the park and I'll shoot around and just kind of, if I run early in the morning and I feel like my legs are kind of tired and, you know, I'll go out and shoot around and that would kind of be my second, you know, workout for the day is just shooting around and, you know, not, you know, extravating too much energy, but just getting out there and having fun. Do you have any favorite video games? Uh, probably Grand Theft Auto. I'm not a big video game player. I actually okay. got asked the other day if I wanted to play a Call of Duty tournament with a bunch of runners. So apparently Josh Thompson's putting on a Call of Duty tournament for a bunch of oh, runners. Oh, and oh. I agreed to it. Yeah, I agreed to it, but I'm not going to be much good at it. But yeah, so Call of Duty or, or GTA, but it's not really too much into video games. Are you um, uh, ODing on Netflix or Prime or do you have any shows that you like to watch? I don't even watch Netflix that much. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think what I do all day. So when you asked me that earlier about my routine, yeah. I was kind of in a slump because I was like, man, what do I do all day? Like sometimes I'll find just random stuff to do, I guess. Like, yeah. you know, took a trip to Ikea with Coco yesterday. That took all day. You know, the day before I <laughs> redecorated the inside of my house. And the day before that, I painted my garage. So it's just, you know, finding random stuff to do. Yeah, before that, wash my car. <laughs> um, so, you know, I got all the time in the world to do, you know, a lot of things. So. For the most part, I'll try to relax if I can or try to rest. But if I feel like I'm being too lazy, I'll go out and try to find something to do. Mainly fishing, I think, will take up the majority of my day if I'm really trying to get after it. That's cool. Um, any new music that you would suggest to our readers? Anything that you're listening to that you like? Um, Lil Baby's pretty good right now. I've been listening to him a lot. Um, um, Lil Baby, Drake came out with a new album. Not really new. It's been a while now. Um, yeah, I'm not really that that on top of the music game either, so I might not be the best person to ask, but Lil Baby I've listened to a lot. Drake I've been listening to a lot lately because he's just so consistent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of some older bands I'll listen to because Craig's into all that, you know, <laughs> things like Aerosmith and Leonard Skiz. Oh, Skizz man, yeah. Lenny Skizzard, Leonard Skiz Skizzard Skinner? or something. Yeah. Is that, Leonard, am I saying that right? Leonard Skizzard. And, Leonard Skinner, yep. Yeah. Yeah, Leonard, so Skinner, Leonard Skinner and all that. Yeah. So... He's kind of making me listen to that whenever I'm in the car with him. But for the most part, I'm just listening to kind of like the hip hop and stuff like that. Okay, I'm going to throw the names of five or six 800 meter runners to you, mm -hmm. and I want you to tell me what you think. I'm El Tuca. Older. Okay. All right. Um, Nigel Amos. Gritty. Um, David Rudisha. <laughs> Legend. Key Learmouth. Who? Uh, the kid from the UK. Uh, it was a guy at Learmouth or Learmouth. Do you know him? Uh-uh. Okay. All right. Um, Clayton Murphy. Who? Clayton Murphy. I gotta watch what I say sometimes. Um, okay. Clayton Murphy. That's a good one because I, I, you know, I try not to, because Clayton and I were, you know, somewhat training partners at times, so I don't sure. ever put any kind of you know, we're not rivals. We're not teammates yeah. at the same time. It just kind of, but I see Clayton Murphy. Mm. Distance runner. Okay. Uh, Bryce Hoppel. Mm. The kid, he's only, okay. you know, six months younger than me, but I've been doing a little longer than him. <laughs> Any of the Europeans that you uh, admire? Any of the 800 guys? Any of the Europeans who I admire? That you admire or that you kind of uh, respect? Or you've had... I, I mean, I have, a, I have a respect for everybody, for sure. Anybody sure. I step on the line with. Um, yeah. ad admire, probably not. I, don't, I, can, I can't even name too many of them, honestly. Uh -huh. um, I'm trying to think of guys that were just in the final. You know, America took up almost half the lane, so that's... Yeah, yeah, he's... Uh, bit of a character and uh, well, what, the difference in when you go to Europe um, 
do you find the race is much more physical than the races you race in the U.S.? Or do you find that at the championships? I, I, I kind of find it a little bit more physical because when you race over in Europe, um, you know, there's a lot of prize money line and that comes into play, but also nobody cares who you are in Europe when you're running down yeah. leagues. Like every, you know, there's a lot of Africans out there. Those are pretty gritty and kind of elbow weight people, but, um, you know, they're also small too. You know, I, I think I got a lot of weight on most 800 meter runners. Um, so I don't really get bullied too much when I'm running a race like that, but in America, I feel like it's not really too boxy. I think everybody kind of gives each other a sort of respect and they kind of know what an athlete can do. You know, so if they see you passing them or if they see you coming to the shoulder and it's a guy like that could, you know, that is supposed to be, <laughs> not supposed to be to my guess, but there's just a lot of respect given for, for running, you know, and, and I go back and watch videos too, where I'm running and I'm racing guys and I'm like, why did he let me do that? Or why did he let me do that? You know what I mean? Because if I was him, I wouldn't have let him do that to me. You know, just taking spaces away from people or cutting people off in certain ways and just kind of not responding to it. Um, but yeah, I think that's the biggest difference between U.S. and in Europe racing, at least that I've seen. If coach said uh, he was going to have you concentrate on the 400 for six months, how fast could you go? How long do I have to train? Six months. I would, I would I'm going to say this. I think I would make the team at least in the relays. Okay. So I think I'd make U.S. team at least for the relays. If I trained for it, you know, it's – I, I trained for it somewhat at A and M, and keep in mind these are all splits, so I split yeah. forty four with him. And yeah. I think if I would, you know, really trained for it and you know, done everything proper, lowered my mileage down, I think I could make a United States team in either a four by four, you know, co-ed relay. Because I have so many positions, positions now for four hundred meter runners, and I think I could, you know, make that team for it. So we're at a championship. You've just won the gold in the eight hundred, and the coaching staff comes up to you and says. Uh, we want you to run the four by four. Would you do it? A hundred percent. Yeah. And I wouldn't do that unless I believe I could actually contribute something better than another person on the team. Yeah. You know, if I think someone was more fitter or, or um, could achieve more and people would benefit more off of him being on the team, I would say no. And I give it to that person. But if I truly believe, which I, there has been instances where I should be on a four by four, I should be on a certain relay, then I would 100% take that spot. And if it's a tie, I'd still take that spot. <laughs> What do you think you could run for the mile if you concentrated on it? I don't even want to think about that. The do you mile? Like distance or not? Not really. I would like to, because I feel like the more I've been out here, the more I've kind of been um, perceived as a guy that should seek potential in the mile. Yeah. Which I don't really feel like I want to. You know, I don't really know if I want to explore that territory. I'm, you know, I'm not breaking 40 miles a week too often. I really, you know, try to keep it in 30s and such. So wow. I think there's potential there that. There's a lot of what ifs, but you know, there's so many what ifs. Like, yeah, I can do what ifs. You know, it's this is that's what I've been able to do for the mile. Maybe that's the best way I can train for the mile. It's yeah. running, you know, 35 to 40 miles a week or 35 miles a week. Um, but yeah, I would love to definitely, you know, explore more territory in the 400 opposed to the mile. But I, I think again, I think I would, I think I, I could make a team if I trained for the mile. I think I'd be on the team for the mile if I trained for it. Did you ever get to talk to Seb Co after your 800 win? I talked to him before, actually. I was talking to um, Seb Co because I was getting treatment by, um, by Dr. By Dr. Josh out there at USATF, and Seb Co was in the warm-up area. And I was getting treatment, and he comes, and I've seen Seb Co before. Like, I'm not really starstruck by the guy. Like, I know he's a great runner and everything. And, yeah. People love to look up to him, but I didn't recognize the dude the first like 10 times I seen him. I didn't know his significance whatsoever. Um, but this time around, I was kind of like, okay, this guy is a big deal. And um, he comes up to me and he shakes my hand. I was like, hey, cool. Like, nice to meet you. I guess good to see you again. And, you know, he said, hey, good luck on your race and all that. I said, hey, thanks. Appreciate that. And that was kind of the end of the conversation. And then behind him was his buddy, David Rudisha. Yeah. And this is the first time I ever met David Rudisha. Wow. And he was behind him and I didn't see it. And I got up really, I, like, I wanted to get up, but I was like, you know, my face just brightened up and I went and shook his hands. Like, oh my gosh, like Mr. Deja, like it's so nice to meet you. It's such an honor. And I looked over at Seb Co and I was like, are you mad that I got really excited to see David Rudisha, but I didn't get that excited to see you? <laughs> um, because I was just literally, I was a little starstruck, you know, because I'm That's not a cool. big running geek, but yeah. I know if I know a runner, yeah. You know, it's got to be a pretty big deal because I don't know that many runners like that. So yeah. seeing David Rudisha for the first time was, you know, a big deal for me. And I, I did feel a little bad because 
I just kind of brushed off needing Seth Cole, which is apparently a big deal. And when I saw Dave Rudish, I was like, man, this guy's like, this is the legend. This is the guy I'm putting on a pedestal. You know, is, is King Rudish. So um, that was the first thing. Dad probably got a kick out of it. He's, he's pretty, pretty gracious and stuff. Yeah, he, he, he seemed fun about it. It seemed like it was, you know, all good. But, you know, I, felt, I, I did feel a little bad afterwards. I got to watch him run in 84 when he got his mm-hmm. second silver medal in the 800 and then came back and won the uh, 1500 and pretty amazing. That's, Not a lot yeah, of to watch him do that stuff. And Rudy yeah, was he, a blast. He looked up to for reason. Oh yeah. No. And Rudish, I mean, the 2012 race is still, you know, you can put it on YouTube and you just kind of go, Oh my gosh, you know, but yeah. I'll tell you when you moved with at 500, I was like, holy heck, he's looking good, man. Is he going to get some room? When did you know you had it? Or did you not think you – were you just fighting to the very end in Doha? I knew – I knew I, with about maybe 300 left. Okay. With 300 left, I knew that, you know, we had a little bit of – Wesley and I had a gap in other people, and I was okay. feeling good, and that's why I took off the way I took off because I was like, I can take off right now. And, you know, if I keep this acceleration, I'm going to run something really great, you know, and, and I was also thinking if I do die a little bit, you know, I still think, you know, I'll win. Yeah. Um, you know, I felt pretty comfortable in the race and where I was at and um, what my PR was compared to other guys. And I was, I was extremely confident going into that final. Yeah. And with, yeah, I guess maybe 250 left once I passed him and the surge that I had on him, I yeah. knew that, you know, he's a hard guy to pass up to who Wesley is. So mm-hmm. if other guys are trying to get around him, they're going to have to work that curve around him. So that went into play about when I was going to try to pass him. But yeah, with 300 meters left, I took off. And then still with 80 meters left, I did tie up. Like that's why Rudisha's race is so crazy. It's because when he went, he went yeah. and, you know, didn't look back, still could finish in like a 25. When I went, I finished like, you know, a 27. So I, that's what I need to work on in my race. It's just, I don't know if it's strength, speed, genetics, what it is, but you, you know, that's got to be something I got to build over time is, being able to, to finish even stronger, being able to make that move and hold that move, you know, not maintain that move, but keep mm-hmm. that or do that move and, you know, accelerate on that move too. And that's something I look back on a lot. And it's like, yeah, that's, you know, not my biggest mistake, but that's the biggest thing I got to work on when, you know, racing at the, the highest level. What do you want to win now? Olympic title, another world championship title, world indoor title. I, you know, I'd like to win my next race. Is what I'd like to win. I'd like to win. Ooh, okay. Um, what's ever in front of me. Um, I, I've, you know, been guilty of looking at races too far ahead in the past, you know, such as 2017 world champs. Yeah. Um, after seeing Emmanuel career and Nigel almost get knocked out in the semis, you know, I was the last race in the semis. So I was like, all right, sweet. If I make this final, like, you know, I got a, I got a good chance of meddling, meddling. I'm going to meddle, you know, and keep in mind, I haven't even raced my semis yet. So, and sure enough, I didn't make the finals because I was so focused on things that didn't even happen yet. Yeah. You know? So I just really had to, I guess, live in the moment type deal. And that's what I've been doing ever since I've been with Pete is not focusing on time, living in the moment. Don't take any race for granted. And going back to Boston, like I said, like I took that race for granted. Like I didn't do everything I wanted to do and just learn from every single race. So, you know, obviously there's levels to every races and there's things that I'll do differently in preparation towards it. Um, but for the most part, it's just, you know, performing to the best of my abilities and, you know, providing some sort of entertainment or some sort of show in, in what I do. Well, Donovan, you've entertained us for about 35 minutes, so you're down to two questions, okay? Okay. All right, so deep ones. Um, What do you love the most about racing? What do I love the most about racing? I think what I like the most about running is I, you know, I went to a high school where I always thought I was going to be a football player when I grew up. I thought okay. I was going to be a football player, a basketball player. And I was, you know, I was pretty good for the most part. I was a late bloomer when it came to my development once high school hit. But, um, you know, I definitely saw myself as a collegiate athlete and, and, and football was my main thing. But when I went to this high school, there's a lot of politics that go into positioning. And I think that's at any high school and even college and even maybe sure. professional, professional level as well. Um, is there's so many politics and, and who gets to start, who gets to play you know, what play I'm going to play, if I'm going to give him attention this game, if I'm not going to give him attention this game. I did a sport and I chose to leave that sport because I wanted to run cross country that fall because, you know, you can't deny somebody a time. You know, when you cross that line, it is a time. It is you. It is, you know, that's, that's what you are. You're as good as your time, you know, and top seven, those are the varsity runners. 
you know, top 15 at state, that's all state, you know, top eight, that's all American. So it's just, everything's just so much more cutthroat. There's no arguing. You can't, you know, there's not really that many fights in track and field because, you know, if you lost, you lost. <laughs> there's not, there's not much you can say about it. In football, you can say, all oh, the refs did this or the coaches did this. They called the wrong play, the player through the game, but in running, it's all you. You're the only one out there. And, you know, when, you know, I'm facing the nose and I got to, you know, face other people, I'm not relying on somebody else. I'm looking over my left or right shoulder thinking someone's going to back me up. It's all me. And I'm the only person out there. And I think that's what I like about the sport. Um, If you had one tip to give young runners about the 800 mile, really middle distances, what would Mm -hmm. you tell them? Hmm. For specifically the mile or the eight? Well, for middle distances. Middle distance runners? And we'll um, do 400. We'll, we'll count the 400 and 800. We'll count, we'll count the 400 and two. Yeah. See, now, now we're in a sticky territory because I know there's a lot of 800-meter runners that want to be 400-meter runners and a lot of 1,500-meter uh-huh. runners that want to be – because Craig's a 1,500-meter runner that's a want to be 800-meter runner. <laughs> and I'm an 800-meter runner that's a want to be 400-meter runner. So I yeah. guess some advice that I could give is, you know, know what you're good at. Don't take an easy cop out, you know. I think in, in high school, I always thought and believed I could be a 400 meter runner. Um, turns out I had more potential in the eight. Yeah, training, I believe, is a lot harder and, you know, it's more painful, but I stuck to what I knew I was good at. And a lot of that comes into coaching and just knowing yourself and being honest with yourself and picking the right event. You know, I think a lot of people, you know, idolize the mile too, because or the 15, because it's the mile. You know, there's so much hype around the mile. It's a sexy event. Yeah. Um, but for the eight, it's like, it's a gritty event. You know, it's like an all out sprint for two laps. And then, you know, you see a lot of guys that, um, I was actually at a Jamaican radio, um, last week and they talked about how Jamaica has no 800 meter runners really. Um, cause at a young age when they're developing these athletes, nobody wants to run the eight cause they're not honest with themselves. Not everybody's a 400 meter runner. Not everybody's using bolt, you know, not everybody can do that. Mm-hmm. So I think people have to be more honest with, um, what they believe they can be best at and not try to take the easy route. You know, I would have loved to try to make, you know, maybe four by fours and I'd probably be a scrub in a four by four and probably a third leg. Um, but I realized I had more potential and I had more to give in the eight. So I chose that route. Donovan, thank you very much. Uh, we've just featured you in social, socially in the distance, which is our new programming on one blog run. Donovan Brazier, you're always a lot of fun. Have enjoy, uh, Portland. I hope you catch some uh, nice trout and I yes, look sir. forward to seeing you in a track meet down the road. <laughs> thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, hello, sports fans. It's Larry Eater with Run Blog Run, and this is the epilogue for Socialing the Distance, and we featured Donovan Brazier. You remember Donovan? Donovan's the 2019 world champion at 800 meters. He made his move in that race with less than 300 to go, and he just flew from the competition breaking the 34-year-old American record, one Johnny Gray, in 142.35. As Donovan will suggest in the interview, some people had considered him before that a choke artist. I don't think Donovan did, and I think he, to be quite honest, he had some really, really good races, and he had some difficult races. Part of it is growing up and going from being a competitive college athlete and high school athlete to being a pro. There's a learning curve there. And um, Donovan needed that learning curve. He learned from his mistakes. He didn't make any mistakes in Doha. You can't make a mistake when you're winning the world championship. And he ran a fantastic race and he ran great rounds. And when I saw him last January in the New Balance indoor meet, the big thing to me was a man who had gotten the monkey off of his back. He didn't, no one could call him a choke artist anymore. No one could say, well, he just didn't perform or underperformed. He had delivered on the world's biggest stage in Doha, a place he dearly loves. He loves that meet in Doha. He loves Qatar. And uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, What I found out was that his days are pretty mellow. He works out. He hangs out with friends. He fishes, likes to fish for trout. Uh, had been raised in Michigan and was a big catfish fan. But, you know, in Oregon, they kind of do this whole trout thing. So he kind of digs that too. 
but he's found a way to relax, and that's important. He's a world-class athlete. He trains under Peter Julian, a fine coach in Oregon, uh, good guy, uh, methodical, um, observant. And when I asked Donovan what it is about Peter that makes that relationship special, he said that he's always preparing us. We talked about the differences with racing in the Diamond League one-off events and the World Championship where you have rounds. And there's a fun story in there about meeting Seb Coe and meeting David Rudisha. But uh, all in all, Donovan Brasher is just a good guy. He's someone you'd like to hang out with. Um, young, I think he's 22 or 23, uh, represented by Mark Wetmore with Global Athletics. Uh, we wanted to thank uh, Sandra Nell for putting this together for us. And, uh, and Donovan for being there, being on time and a good sense of humor. But I think the key in an interview is, as a journalist, I want to learn something new about the athlete. I want to learn something new about that person. And uh, I've interviewed Donovan several times. And each time, I learn a little bit more. And what I see now is a seasoned, confident, world-class athlete who enjoys living in Portland, who's got friends, and is trying, like all of us, to stay safe in the COVID-19 pandemic. This is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run for Socialing the Distance. Thank you again to Donovan Brazier. Thank you again to Sandra Nell, the... Uh, PR director for Global Athletics, and thanks again to Mark Wetmore, the CEO of Global Athletics. And Donovan, have a good season. I hope to see you race soon. This is Larry Eater signing off. Oh, and thanks again to Mike Deering, who produces this and puts all up with all this stuff for me so many days a week. Mikey, love you. Talk to you soon. Thank you.